Welcome everyone to the second part of our hashtag Hidden Fashion History series and today we're going to look at the British brand Simon Massey. This time I'm joined by people who've donated photos of his beautiful clothes from their private collections or ones that they're selling in the present day. Their shops are linked down below, you're going to see them and like our Julian Rose film I'm going to tell you a story. It's the story of a girl with warm blonde wavy hair fresh out of school in Hull who knew exactly who Simon Massey was and why his clothes were so respected. But we'll take our journey right into the 70s when another young woman called Janice Wainwright had taken over the firm and you're going to be stunned by the difference between the decades. So sit back and relax as the story unfolds. A tale of women and their influence on fashion and the story of a label that makes our hearts pound with nostalgia and clothes that are breathtaking as well. From when it first appeared, Simon Massey needed no introduction to the fashionable public. So when Tanya walked through the door to the house of Morel as their brand spanking new junior straight after Easter 1951, it wasn't for her either. Although young, she had a perceptive, keen eye. She wasn't green when it came to fashion. Before, in the weeks following, Morel shaped her taste. Smart, expensive, tailored suits for women was the Massey signature and she saw the smiles of Mirelle's clients playing across their faces hungry for new designs. Which name will he give this one, they thought in moments of fun, searching for what made him so distinctive. Designs like these were given a name, much better than the anonymous numbers that mannequins paraded to fashion buyers clutched in their hands. Oh, it's a bit like naming children his favourite, they would have thought. Except these clothes are miles away from what a child would wear. So incredibly well crafted and gosh, how womanly. A Scottish company says later newspaper reports, although this was not truthful and there was also not a person called Simon Massey either. The label was well established before Tanya arrived and although not the only maker of women's suits in Britain, had a reputation for fine tailoring. Adverts in February 1944 saying high class Mayfair Couture House, a phrase echoed in the wording of Mirelle's own 1940s adverts. Couture meant made to measure, a process whereby measurements would be supplied to them and they'd make them accordingly. Inside the workroom at Simon Massey, they took a series of intricate steps that had to be taken when working with heavy fabrics. The cutting, the tacking, the interfacing, the ironing and shaping. What Mirelle workroom girls Liz and Janet in the 60s and 70s called heavy work meaning working on the woolens and woolen mixes that tailors also use to make men's suits. It was an art as well as a skill and as many layers of the Simon Massey workforce were needed to realise these complex designs as there were stitches and stages holding them together. Working from his salon at 6 Upper Grosvenor Street in London since before 1943, as bombs fell around them, then he struggled to staff his workroom like Mirel did at the same time. And because of the mainstay of his business, it was those who could tailor who were away fighting where the firm felt the most impact. But it was also opportune for the first of many young women who appear in the Simon Massey story, not only Tanya, as you'll hear. In November 1945, petite sales girl Peach Bernabo packed her bags from number six and that of Simon Massey's samples and headed from London to America to sell her designs. Who could have guessed what had happened? These one-off items made up to show buyers when it was bereft of talent during wartime were hers and hers alone. 
after the last designer left in 42 and with zero training and experience apart from her proper job in the showroom, she balanced great heavy rolls of fabric in her arms in front of the exacting eyes of Massey's cutters, people trained in the art of translating patterns into cutting cloth with a very steady hand and eye. Words tumbling as she struggled to bridge her vision. Oh, I don't know the word for this, but I'd like it like that, she'd have said, going with her instinct. And as they looked on and as she folded cloth across a dress form, they interpreted her ideas expertly. It was her collections that Mr Friedman, head of the Massey workroom, needed part and full-time workers for in March 1945. Top pay and bonus, they read, for highest class dressmaking and ladies tailoring. Pressers, tailors, skirt hands, felling hands. 37A Brook Street, White Lion Yard, they read. It was not at number six, but a location that since evolved from where it began off Brook Street, west of New Bronze Street, into Lancaster Court in London in the present day. Whether it was Peach or another member of the Massey team that continued to conjure up the playful names that women decide so eagerly has been lost over time. But his adverts show the outfit de jour outfit of the day was combined with the very British trait of wry humour, not taking themselves too seriously. Even though Mr Friedman knew it was a very serious business indeed and like the Miwell work, room. Woe betide if any expensive fabrics were damaged by careless hands. Moving back to number six when the challenges of war were more behind them, Bastille was advertised in 1945, a name redolent of wartime, naming another after Goodwood Racecourse, also suggesting to the minds of the readers where they could be worn in spring summer 46. And after he became the member of the London Model House Group in the same year, these designs played more and more in the minds of women that really sought out tailoring from his adverts. He made gorgeous evening gowns like this one, but like cards turning over in a game of solitaire, in woollen after woollen, silhouette after silhouette, the massy suit stuck in people's consciousness and that guaranteed the firm's security and success. Had Tanya seen into the future in 1951, however, so much a part of the fabric of British fashion was he, so solid, so British, so much about the tailoring that parts of British couture was known for, she couldn't have predicted another woman would arrive at 6 Upper Grosvenor Street in the 60s and completely revolutionise this. In Tarnish years, Winter Splendour, the imaginatively named Mirelle fashion show in our Julian Rose video, had happened in 1950, the year before she joined, and its programme had this splendid example of tailoring on page four, drawing readers' eyes to opposite the introduction that Mira penned in her expressive flowing hand. Pressing click on the camera, the photographer captured the model corseted into what looks very much like a man's dinner suit reinvented for the chic urban woman. Slick, tight and in black woolen worsted, its finely defined texture unseen against the building, the railing stood out in the stock photo Mira asked the printers to include in the programme. She knew those steps and railings very well indeed. Simon Massey's salon at 6 Upper Grosvenor Street was merely steps away from the tall leafy trees of Mayfair's Grosvenor Square and her footsteps would have tapped on the white stone stairs up to the door, impressive buildings looking on. And after viewing his collections and the chit chat of selling, she came back with this suit to sell to the urbane women of Hull. In the programme, it was advertised singly but in his main advert, it was joined by others, each, as you can see, very different, but still examples of exquisite tailoring. 
Suit in Barathea and grow grain bottom left. Suit in worsted bird's eye in the middle, the mannequin looking to all intents and purposes like a 30s screen goddess. Belted suit in Barathea. And next to her, suit and coat in matching checks. Names of the fabrics would have been known to customers. They were naturally well informed. Their language about the range of textiles on offer had to be. Each meant something different, suggesting weight, whether they were smooth or textured, as well as the colour and weave. And that again told them how it would feel on their body and also the additional costs in caring for them and cleaning. Most would be dry cleaned. And in Hull, Xerneys was the name most would approach for caring for these types of clothes. As the mannequins walked down his steps towards the canopy of trees opposite the American embassy, birds rustling and calling, leaves brushing the sky, a variety of fabrics occupied their hourglass figures as if they were moulded to them and would never be removed, as much a part of them as their hairdos and measurements. As women collected at the New York Hotel in Hull to watch their show, Winter Splendour, exclusive to the House of Mirel, said the description underneath the photo they looked at in the programme. Narrated by compares like Mira herself, as mannequins walked on the catwalk, a black worsted barathea suit with leaves of grow grain on the pockets and on the colour, it has a slimly cut skirt and tailored jacket, by Simon Massey represented solely in Hull by the House of Mirel. If Tanya had read this programme as a 14-year-old schoolgirl, she could be forgiven for feeling, oh my goodness, but it was a big job to step into. Number 60 King Edward Street and the salon in Ariel Chambers were headline news grabbers in Hull. Leaving school age 15, Exactly one week before she started, she was nervy, as you'd have been in that situation, but was very much looked after and welcomed by the team. Little Val, Valerie Birchall, was almost the same age, although a year senior to Tanya, and recognised her fashion sense immediately, as must have Mira Mountain, who did not employ just anyone, and under her watchful gaze in the first weeks, tall and willowy first sales Olga Faye ran things on the shop floor. Inches above Tanya's own height, she was a natural model, something Tanya feared. Mira's manager, flame-haired Molly Kidd, darted around with pins in her hands, holding everything together, while their new junior busied herself cleaning the chandeliers and making sure the glass door to 60 King Edward Street was free of fingerprints. She'd got to know Christine Edwards quickly, full of flair and artistic talent. She'd sketched for their programme, some of which were still laying around. Simple line drawings representing outfits as they were often seen in vogue. Mirelle's designer penned illustrations throughout their programmes of clothes they offered or services like remodelling furs. Their newer fashion show, Step Into Spring, had happened in March, just before Tanya started, and Tanya discovered rubbing tired feet. Trade was as brisk as ever. She saw Simon Massey come and go often in the showroom, as befits a well-known British brand. Step Into Spring displayed this less formal suit by him. Held in March after the dreary winter months, said Mira, it was a beautifully tailored suit in finest red bottle and white pinstriped check suiting, she said, by Simon Massey, represented in Hull solely by the House of Mirel. Solely was correct. All my research shows no one else had this Simon Massey suit anywhere nearby, proving all over again, like we said in Winter Splendour, if you want it. You've got to come to us. Shoppers at Step Into Spring would have recognised this outfit. Named after its finely defined fabric, 
Ladybird had appeared in the Sketch magazine in January 1951, written again by Elizabeth Penrose as she wrote about the Susan Small gown we featured, and it gave more information also. It is in fine worsted with a tiny spot, she wrote. To the reader, worsted meant a finely woven woolen yarn and added that the women of Hull could stand out from their friends who might also like to purchase Ladybird by buying it in different colours. Blue, beige and grey effects, she added. Worsted was good for warmer months and it had an extravagant five buttons closing it down the front, putting some distance in design between the austerity rules and limitations of wartime which most would remember and, although utility was still available then, the start of 1951. By September of that year, Tanya had acclimatised and was growing in confidence. Phone calls or requests came in with the women who shop there. I've seen Cinzano in Tatler. Do you stock it? Locally, town and country, a name redolent of high-class lifestyles and the occasion dressing that went with them was no different from London. Town meant lunch at Hammond's restaurant, a pit stop while they shopped, thinking of Beverly Racecourse a few miles away, the luscious greens of Yorkshire and Holderness, dotted with streaks of guardsmen red from their hunts and the rustle of stiff nets and taffetas at their hunt balls. Town and country often mixed within metres of their homes, and as women streamed past Hammond's windows along Jameson Street from Paragon Station towards the house of Mirelle, desired silhouettes and textiles followed in their minds, as well as labels. Hammond's would have been the ideal place to find Simon Massey, it really would, and certainly would be later on in the decade when he was no longer exclusive to the House of Mirel, another change that was coming. But in the turn into the 50s, as Mira said, if you wanted him, you had to walk down Jameson and turn left towards 60 King Edward Street, past Irene Leonard's great convex window displaying a different wedding gown each week and find your way to Ariel Chambers. The locations on this channel will show you those places for yourselves. The first fashion show Tanya would be on the inside for was fast being arranged in a flurry for October 1951 and all the preparations took place after Mira and Molly returned from London buying for the busy social season. Parties and balls created an influx of queries not to mention what to wear for the misty days that fell over Queen Victoria Square and Hull's shopping streets. Autumn poem, Mira decided, would be the next one which gave her the opportunity to include a poem enticing people into the salon to buy. Yellow the bracken, golden the sheaves, it began, and Mira again gave full flow to her innate mix of publicity and enthusiasm. Colourful warm woolies, well-tailored pure wool suits and cosy winter coats, these are musts, she emphasised, in capitals, obviously thinking of the outfit on the front cover. Huddled with Molly in their office, Molly's Mancunian strength and Mira's creative flair merged as they decided what they were going to say. The House of Mirel have chosen for the cover of Autumn Poem a lovely ensemble by Simon Massey. Deep hyacinth blue flecked black street velvet, it continued, describing the short, soft bristles of an otherwise luxurious fabric created for the everyday wear of a suit like this, hence the name. The name of this ensemble is Firework and Cracker, it continued. In October 1951, on page 58 of British Vogue, we can see the same outfit. A Simon Massey suit called Firework giving more information. 
It says it's in French patterned velvet and costs about £28, a bit different from the phrase street velvet mirror used. It's advertised with cracker, a fitted coat in matching velvet and Cinzano lattice and smuggler also, then tucked later on in the programme, is this second suit on page nine called Night. Described as a Simon Massey suit in Barathea, trimmed with braid and exclusive to the house of Mirel. Taken beside another proud row of railings, signifying status and town, the model shows a tight-fitting skirt suit with a very small waist, flared out from the waist to the hips. It's made with princess lines along the bodice, breaking two panels of fabric across the chest. Picked out in the same way, the reverse were highlighted with banding in a light shade. It's very formal, smart and typically Simon Massey, all of which would have had the phones at the House of Mirel ringing off the hook, creating more work for Olga, Christine, Little Val and Tanya as they rushed to respond. Climbing the rickety lift to Ariel Chambers, after autumn poem, boxes and boxes filled the packing room from Simon Massey and when Tanya saw them arriving and his unmistakable flowing signature on them, she knew she had to purchase a suit that was so beautiful she'd recall it over 50 years later in 2016. Outside my room, when we sat side by side to talk, the trees of Pearson Park stretched their wings while people played on the grass in the late September sunshine and my recorder was whirring. Tanya and I shared her memories. The label wasn't a stranger to me but I kept back most of what I knew because I wanted to know what Tanya would say. She mentioned Simon Massey first and I asked her about it and whether she got a discount due to working at Morel. And this is what she said, a memory of a time of her life long before becoming the grandmother she is today. I would have thought so, she said of the discount. The time I worked there, I couldn't afford them and that was it. But I went home to my grandmother. I said, I think I used to give her 10 shillings a week like board. And she said, keep that and pay it off. So I did. And this suit, it had Simon Massey in the lining, grey, charcoal grey and three sizes of pearl buttons. And I want to say it cost £21, which was the earth then. Tanya was right. She was there for three years and if she bought it in 1952, it would have been about £500 today. Did you wear it a lot? I asked looking at her short, well-kept honey blonde hair, glancing at her gold wedding ring, still shiny and bright, imagining the outline on her slim, petite frame. Yes, she said. I managed to get a three-tone grey taffeta blouse. In those days, a tie and a bow, because it had wide reverse, she said talking about the width of the lapel around the neckline as if she wasn't going to, but remembered to use the word with me that she'd used at work at the time. And I think it had pearl buttons here and here. She gestured to where buttons would be just below where the bow would finish at the top of her breastbone. Then I went to Blackpool and something. I got a pair of high heel and pearlized steel grey shoes that went with it. It went perfect. Don't ask me about a handbag. I can't remember anything else she finished. Tanya finished talking about this Simon Massey suit, leaving me stunned that she had such a good memory of this outfit, drawing it so exactly as if she put it back in her wardrobe yesterday. Sitting in another jacket, one that reminded me of Chanel, she and I both knew that £21 was a breathtaking amount of money from such a good label, even more with Mirelle's prices on top, which always made it dearer, although that aspect to the transaction was left unsaid. But she said something else. She said this suit made other people feel things too, like she'd gone from a child to a woman when she wore it. I sat looking into her eyes, 
feeling memories of her younger self appear, one that polished the door in her first job, a task that seemed a million miles away from the hull as it is now. But she wasn't the only lady at Morel who had such a clear memory of his designs. Little Val did also, and her recollections were as clear as that bright autumn day. Stripes were popular in 1950, seen in Hebe Sports, another famous brand who also made suits and will also cover in this channel. In Winter Splendour, the year of the horizontal stripe, a 15-year-old little Val was handed two tiny poodles to model with along the catwalk, producing this endearing photograph afterwards that she's donated to the archive. For the young set, meaning her own age, she commented, of who the suit was made for as she turned the photo over in her hands and slid it across the table. Simon Massey's suit, she added, like the one in the photograph, she said, linking together this photo and one donated to the Mirel archive by Christine Edwards' daughter, Mary, in 2017, that I'd sent Val with Mary's permission. It struck me how the distance of time hadn't faded her memory in the slightest, and she nodded when I said so, valuing her ongoing and excellent memory of then, she didn't say exactly which photo though, there were four of them that Mary donated, but I was stirred because I noticed it too and knew exactly what she meant. Mary's photo shows Christine Edwards artfully arranging a suit in the window of 60 King Edward Street, Rita, another showroom girl, smiling and looking on. Taking in July 1950, the reflections of the street opposite, still pockmarked from the war, show a happy moment and broad smiles. Christine's arranging another striped suit, which records show could have been from Hebe Sports or Simon Massey, but with a similar clarity over the decades as Tanya, Little Val identified it. She was there in the background to this photo, somewhere on scene, modelling their outfits. And as we can't reach into the window as Christine is to examine the label, the maker of this suit is something about which we can never be certain. But there was a clarity, a certainty in the way Val talked about it. And like Tanya, her clarity was so unwavering that I trust her instinct about this suit implicitly. Mira was correct in saying, in this era at least, Simon Massey was represented solely by the House of Morel at this time. Not even Hammond's, commented clients of the huge department store rising like an ocean liner opposite Paragon Station, but the 50s would change things. Eventually, market forces and the persuasive influence of other fashion buyers meant Morel lost a grip on their exclusive status. Hammonds often stocked Simon Massey, and as time, time wore on like this suit in an article in Tatler on the 17th of July 1957, sold at John Lewis Oxford Street and, they said, Hammonds of Hull. It was indeed the shape of things to come, as in this era, Hammonds became Mirel's competitor for British wholesale couture labels, including those mass-produced, if not exact, items that were still exclusive to their clients in Hull. And as the years moved on, others followed, as we'll see, so stick around. Mirel, however, said showroom girl Sue, was nothing like the competition whatsoever. Mirel was always head and shoulders above even Hammonds of Hull. Autumn Poem is the last time we've got a photo in the Mirel archive that we can confirm directly with Simon Massey, but thankfully we've got pictures of his adverts from over the years following, including this one from a feature around the same time in October called Clothes and the Car, which specifically mentions the house of Mirel Hull. This suit was made from Barathea and was about £27. As one of their labels, which means something they were assured of stocking, Anything that was displayed in the pages of magazines would have been sourced by Mirelle as naturally as picking up the phone to a friend because that's how Mira and Molly would have been treated. It wasn't 
big like Canon's, but they almost always sold anything anyone wanted and were a powerhouse, a distinctive small retailer with a character all of their own. It was much more than sales, it was personality. It had class, the tall trees and railings of Mayfair no different in their thinking than the doorway to Ariel Chambers or the historic red stripes of the building they occupied. Their impeccable store window reminiscent of Paris was the influence Mirror brought to everything very much intentional and accurate, having been a customer of British and French couture throughout her professional life. In London, however, things were changing again. People were fed up with memories of wartime and even the fashions that were created then. Frederick Stark decided a new way of making and selling clothing was important, borrowed partly from America, which would become the way forward. And that meant standardising sizing and making in quantities in advance, a practice we'd recognise today. There was an ebb and flow to fashion in the 50s and with staff at the House of Mirel also. But suits remained a staple in every well-to-do woman's wardrobe. Tanya stayed at the House of Mirel long enough to meet and become friends with Maureen Norris, who you've met in our other showroom videos, but to also see Christine Edwards, Olga and Little Val move on to other things. Eventually leaving after about three years in April 1954 when she was 18, poodles like the one Little Val howled in the autumn poem fashion show still appeared in fashion in the mid-century, but this time as a motif on clothing, a design. Some of the clothes you've seen illustrating the next part of the story are from contemporary newspapers and magazines, some from the Mirel collection and this one from an eBay seller I've listed down below in the US. Our eye was drawn like yours is probably also to the striking red of the jacket, so red as to suggest a riding habit and the black curls of the collar unmistakably real lamb. The soft sheen is because it's made of velvet. Short, fine, densely packed hair, sometimes from silk, the most expensive and intensive way of manufacturing. And no, we don't know which one it is, unfortunately. But we do know it's early Simon Massey because of the label. It was found in a yard sale for $10, now worth, of course, far more than that because of the old label and the status on the fashion landscape. We can see it's double breasted and in this bright red and if part of a suit would originally have had a set a skirt included. Aren't you curious about where it ended up? Like we are and also about the year of manufacturer where do you think it was made? Do tell us we'd be really really curious to know. Carnation red was a colour trend in autumn winter 61 and was often teamed with black and I suppose it's possible it was made then. But don't forget that Peach once took samples in her suitcase to America and exports happened, as well as buyers appearing in London for the international market. Years later, it was sourced at a yard sale in America, the original owner holding onto it for over 50 years, which shows its value to her. And it turns out this would not be the last design that ended up abroad, so stay tuned. Liz Tregenza has donated these pictures to our story also. Her book on wholesale couture is linked below. The one on the left is instantly recognisable as an early 50s jacket, she says, and we really like the hourglass silhouette it makes on the mannequin and the button detailing as well as the wide rivers also, the top part of the lapel similarly bound in velvet this time. It's very elegant and tasteful, probably looking very much like it does on the body as it does on this mannequin. Can you see Tanya in this? pulling the looped grey satin bow of a blouse through the front as she closed it and arranging it against the front. This and the maroon coat on the right of this picture was around the same time she was in Morel, both collected by Liz. Who knows? Maybe Tanya unpacked it, swathed in rustling tissue paper from a Simon Massey box. And from this photo, we can see the repeated logo of Simon Massey that Tanya described on the lining of her suit, which is 
absolutely marvellous to have sight of after so many years. Before we leave this era, take a look at this gorgeous jacket, which has an early Massey label in it. Made of spotty red fabric and so striking, I wondered if it might come from the 40s because you can see that influence in it. I thought of Betty Grable when I first saw it or singers who'd wear it singing swing time and jazz, but perhaps it isn't. Spots like those in Ladybird were a trend in 1951 and for the summertime when garden parting, parties and weddings were everywhere, this jacket might have been crafted for them. We can't be sure those folks and here's where research comes into play because each of these items I've looked for in surviving adverts and available magazines and you'll see coming up this sort of work in detail. But what do you think? 40s, 50s or an occasion to wear it, let us know in the comments or on our socials or on our Facebook page. Here are a few more 50s designs while we wait for the 60s to start. After showroom girl Sue started at Morel around 1956, as did Peggy Wilson, the wedding wizard you met both in the showroom videos, we see jackets becoming much more fluid and boxy. Sleeves staying slender but ending at three quarter length further up the arms and suits made in jersey knits much more loose and floppy also in the occasional silks and satins that we use. So a gradual loosening of the rigidity of the early 50s that was Tanya and Little Val's time. It was Maureen, Peggy and Sue who sold clothes at 11 Story Street moving from King Edward in 1956 and by that time another young woman far away from Hull in Wimbledon in a nice part of London, brushed her straight blonde hair as she did before school every morning, parting it straight down the middle and, carrying a sketchbook and pencils, walked into her very first life drawing class, which at the age of 13 in 1953 shocked her to the very core as it was the first time she'd seen a naked man. We've come to the end of part one of the Simon Massey story. Did you enjoy it? Don't forget to subscribe and come back for part two, where you'll see how that 13 year old girl became this woman, the change maker, and see how she revolutionized and modernized this very, very British brand.